<laughs> I, think, I think they're cheering for me. No, not they're you. not. How many of you believe it is a fun thing to follow Jesus? <laughs> Until you find out where he's going. He's going to a cross and he wants each and every one of us to follow him. And it's at that cross that we find life and life more abundantly. Now, Jason and I, we wanna tell you a little bit about our story, how we built our businesses, and then we landed a reality show. We ended up getting the boot, not because of anything other than the fact that he looked a little bit heavy on camera. We'll talk a little about that. But before we get started, you know, I just, we are honored to be here at Northview Church. And all the campuses across this state, this is an amazing place. And we are so thankful for God behind bars, all of you joining in. Uh, it's just an honor for us to be here. Pastor CJ and Pastor Joe and Pastor Jason and the team having us. It is a real honor to be here. Now, those guys have the luxury of when they get to speak, they're not lugging along their little brother. This is my little guy, Jason. We are identical twin brothers. I am two minutes older than him. I'm better looking, sir. I'm just saying what you're thinking. You got your box there and yep, I'm better looking. <laughs> yeah. David is the only mistake God ever made. He was born and God looked down and said, whoops, got to fix that. <laughs> and I came along. I'm the do-over. I'm the fix to the mistake. So we live in Charlotte, North Carolina, grew up in Dallas. We'll tell you a little bit about our story, but how many of you recognize there are some things shifting in the culture in America? It ain't the same America that we used to see years ago. Things have changed. The question is, has the truth changed? Has the gospel changed? Does the cross still have power? And it does. Because the problem today is not the presence of darkness. The problem's the absence of light. I don't go to bed at night and turn darkness on. This guy here doesn't open up the closet to put on whatever this suede thing is. He doesn't open the closet and all the darkness from the closet come and fill the room. It's not the nature of darkness. The only way darkness prevails in our culture is when the light is turned off. Now, Jesus tells us, he didn't say, I'm the light of the world. He said, you, the church, those who know Christ, you are the light of the world. So often today, we have the temptation to dim our light or even to turn our light off so that we don't get in trouble by some cancel culture, or some alphabet mafia or whatever's coming after us. It does, whatever, it's, it gets, we get afraid of this kind of stuff. But listen, this is the moment in which we live and the Lord wants us to step into it with his power and his love and he wants us to live for him and shine our light. And when we do, guess what? It does two things. On the one hand, it reveals your good deeds. On the other hand, it exposes the world's evil deeds. That's right straight out of the Bible. I didn't make that up. Matthew chapter five, verse 16. Do you even know that? For God so loved the world. No. Did he, no. No. Matthew five, that's John three sixteen. When in doubt. Matthew five sixteen. I got five kids, by the way, he's only got four, and when I'm teaching my kids as they were young, and I'm like, you know, doing a little Bible study with them, what's the answer? They're like, Jesus, God, yeah. Jesus. It's like, okay, that's a safe place. John 3, 16, that's a safe place. But Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You know what those good works are? It's the way that we treat our spouses, the way we raise our kids, the way we tip our service, the way we live. We wanna live it out. Now we're gonna talk about, a lot of people know why we got fired, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but we also wanna talk about why we got hired. So we're gonna talk about three paradigms and three principles today that you can take away from here and go out and shine your light. We'll get to that in a minute. Because Matthew 5, 16 is there, but there's a balancing truth in scripture. John, or John chapter three says, darkness hates the light because it exposes that its deeds are evil. Now is not a time to dim our light. Now is the time to shine it bright. Now, we have the wrong idea of light in the church today. How many of you grew up singing the song, This Little Light of Mine, right? This Little Light of Mine. Now, there's a verse in there that says, don't let Satan blow it out, right? I heard a few people go, it out. <laughs> but you can't do that if you're Baptist because that could lead to dancing, and we know Baptists don't shake that leg. No, no. Don't Sinners. shake the leg. No, but you know, the idea in our mind, the image that comes into our mind when we sing that song is that our light is to be like a candle. Well, but that's a problem because what happens when the wind comes along and blows on a candle? What happens to the light? What? It goes out. 
You see, in today's cancel culture, when the winds of culture are now starting to blow to try to extinguish our light, we need to replace the image of a candle with the image of a coal, like the burning ember inside of a fire pit. What happens when the wind comes along and blows on that? Do you see the difference? The same wind that extinguished the candle's light ignites the coal's light. What's the difference between a candle and a coal? A candle is lit from the outside. A coal, it burns from the inside. The great prophet Jeremiah said, your word is like a fire shut up in my bones and I am weary of holding it in. Do you know how God gets the light that's in you out into the world? He puts you in situations and oftentimes even around people who will try to extinguish the light that's in you. But if you've been spending time alone with the Lord in prayer and the study of scripture, then listen, when the winds of culture begin to blow on you, you don't have to try to shine your light. You just have to buckle up and let yourself burn. Do you guys wanna be coals or candles? Coals. We wanna be coals, yeah. right? See, we were raised by a pastor dad who taught us these things. And we were raised in Dallas, Texas, home of God's favorite football team. <laughs> no? That's why there's a hole in the top of the stadium so God can look down and watch his boys play. It's his favorite team. Now, our you dad, guys need to be praying for the Cowboys. Yes, you Seriously, should. pray for them. Yes. Are you Christians here or not? Yeah. <laughs> now, our dad taught us to go to the Bible for everything and put it into practice, or as he would say, turn your theology into biography. Your thoughts about God need to translate into the way that you live your life. So he said, boys, get into the scripture. So from an early age, at the age of 12, we started reading the New Testament every single year, from cover to cover. Then by the time we were 18, he said, let's start reading the Bible every year. So since then, we're 48 now, since 18, Bible, cover to cover. And just keep reading, keep reading, because God's always gonna show you some new stuff. In 94, we left Dallas. We went to play baseball at Liberty University. Out of Liberty, I was drafted by the Baltimore Orioles. He was drafted by a lesser organization, the Boston Red Sox. You guys don't even know who the Orioles are. He they said Boston, no socks. <laughs> Boston, funny. what? Yeah, no socks? I played third base for the Orioles. He was a tailback for the Red Sox. He'd run out on the field and coach say, get your tail back on the bench, boy. I just sit here and take it. I like heard that. somebody clap. Don't yeah. do that again. I like you up here. Don't interrupt me. <laughs> we played professional baseball several years, got out of professional baseball. We were minor league guys, didn't make a lot of money. We moved our families to Charlotte, North Carolina, and we started a business in 2003. We didn't have any business training whatsoever, but we were armed with the principles of the Bible and a promise that we would apply them to the way that we did our work. By God's grace, within seven years, by 2010, we had grown that business to 100 locations in 35 different states. Started opening up other businesses. That began to get us into a point where we were able to start making investments in real estate, and then some crazy stuff started happening. That's when a production company reached out to us in the spring of 2013. They said, do you guys want a reality show? We said no. Heck yeah, we'll take a reality show. What do you think, we're nuts? So they came and they put a commercial together. They took it to LA. Five networks wanted us. The first offer we got was from TLC. They wanted us to do a show called Twinning. Still have no idea what that was all about because in the middle of negotiating with them, the general manager from HGTV called my cell phone. Didn't call his, called mine. You're a good assistant. That was luck. <laughs> that was luck. He walked into that one. They called me and said, hey, listen, we just signed Chip and Joanna Gaines to a show called Fixer Upper in Waco. We gave them a one-hour pilot. We want to give you guys six one-hour episodes to a show called Flip It Forward. And we want to take the Gaines in Waco with Fixer Upper and the Benham families in Charlotte with Flip It Forward, and we want to raise you guys to the top of the network. So we signed with HGTV. Now, all of a sudden, we get five weeks into a 10-week film shoot. Commercials are now running in the spring of 2014. We're just about to air our premiere. Fixer Upper was getting incredible reviews right on the heels of them. Flip it, heels of that episode, Flip It Forward was going to air. And the general manager calls and says, guys, I've got great news. This is about 9 p.m. the evening after our five weeks of filming. We had five more weeks left. She said, all these endorsements are coming in. We had Disney World. I mean, all these endorsements coming in. We had a big book deal. Everything was lined up. And she said, but there's an activist group out of California that says you guys are haters and bigots. But don't worry about that because we told them that's just a narrative that's been written about you. Now, why on earth would they say things about us like that? I get this guy, but me? Well, back when our businesses were growing in the early 2000s, we would travel the country and speak and say, God's ways don't just apply to business, they apply to every single area of life. Every area of life. The earth is the Lord's and everything that's in it. And so 
Even those areas that are somehow now politically incorrect, even those areas Christians aren't allowed to talk about. Well, I can tell you this, the more that we focused on this platform that we didn't wanna lose, the more afraid we began to get. Because the general manager is now saying, hey, listen, these activist groups are starting to put pressure. So Jason and I get together and we said, let's write an email to HGTV. And here's what that email said. HGTV, these are our beliefs and we're never gonna back off of them. However, when we represent your network in public, we'll be quiet about it. Now listen, don't judge me. He was the one that wrote, he's, it was his idea actually. But, but here's the deal. Jason and I, we had enough sense to know better than to send it to HGTV. We decided to send it to a spiritual mentor first because now all of a sudden we're writing this email trying to save our show. We are now operating out of a fear of man and no longer a fear of God. We were focusing on that platform we didn't wanna lose rather than the person who put it there in the first place. So we sent it to a spiritual mentor of ours. We knew better than to send it to our dad. We knew what he would say. So we sent it to a pastor we thought would agree with us. And within a few minutes, he sent us a scathing email back saying, how dare you boys write an email like this? How do you know God hasn't raised you up for such a time as this, not to give you a reality show, but to tear down a stronghold that's keeping Christians quiet about things that matter in this country? He said, you don't need to send that email, you need to repent. How about that? So we repented, we asked Jesus to forgive us of the fear of man and a man-pleasing spirit, and we stood strong. Well, fast forward, all of a sudden we start getting texts from friends across the country, what's happening with your show? We said, we don't know, we're gonna be stars, that's all we know. They said, have you seen HGTV's Facebook page? Well, we went to their Facebook page. At the very top of the Facebook page, the morning after the general manager called us, we were reviewing the Benham Brothers show and underneath it, hundreds of comments, just disgusting, filthy comments about us and our families because the activist groups wrote a brand new narrative the night before. And by this time, we were public figures, so you can smear public figures all you want. You can't do it to a private citizen, but you can lie about a public figure, and they did and they circulated their activist groups, and the next thing you know, HGTV thought the sky was falling. So we were getting mic'd up that next morning, 9 a.m., we get a text from the general manager who said, hey, can you guys hop on a quick conference call with me and a couple executives out of Scripps, New York. So we got on the call, put it on speaker, right out of the gate, guys were canceling the show. This is right before the premiere. Well, after I got Jason out of the fetal position and I knocked the thumb out of his mouth, Next thing you know, we're on 200 one-on-one interviews all across the country, all the CNNs, all the Foxes. You guys saw some of those. Good Morning America, Nightline. We were even on HBO with Bill Maher. Bill said we were the nitwit twin brothers that believe the same dumb book that millions of Americans believe. You know what an honor it is to be called a nitwit for Jesus? It's an honor. But we found out in the middle of that that the power of the Holy Spirit will fill his kids when you get thrown into something like that. The word of God is true, and we are spiritually bulletproof because greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. It's time for us to stand strong. See, David and I recognize that boldness apart from brokenness makes a bully. That's why God had to first show us how cowardly we really were. Like, we were gonna back down from being public about our faith. Uh, Guys, seriously, we were gonna do that, but then we were convicted. And so God showed us that the, the secret to courage is first recognizing your inner coward and then allowing the Holy Spirit to unleash your inner lion. So we wanna equip you guys today so that you guys can stand strong for your faith. Do you want to stand strong for your faith? If that's you, raise your hand. See, I love, we're in the right place. We're in the right place. We wanna equip you with three paradigms and three principles. Now, paradigm is how you view the world. It's how you see. Stephen Covey, who wrote the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, said if you want small changes, change your attitude. You want big changes, change your paradigm. You have to change how you see. And the number one way to do that is to how you see your identity. See, the devil knows that how you see yourself determines how you behave yourself. So I wanna give you three paradigms that are true about you who are believers in the workplace, who are believers right here and you know Jesus Christ. Here are three things that are true about you that the devil does not want you to know about yourself. Here are these three paradigms. Number one, you're a minister. You're in full-time ministry right where you are. Did you know that? What defines the minister is not where he's placed or how he's paid. It's about passion, not position. It's about God's presence in your life. And you're on mission, and your work is worship. What is your mission? Your mission is to build and advance and to grow God's kingdom by providing for your family and your future generations 
and promoting God's kingdom agenda on the earth. This is true about you. And finally, your work is worship. You know, the Hebrew word for work is the same Hebrew word for worship. So in the Bible, when you see worship, that's, that, that word is avodah, A-V-O-D-A-H. That's the Hebrew word for worship. That's the same word used for work. Work and worship were meant to go hand in hand. Your work, the work that you do, is your primary form of worship. But what we've done in English is we separated it into two words, where worship is what we do on a Sunday when we come to church, but work is what we do on a Monday when we go to the office or we go to school. It's not supposed to be that way. See, the devil doesn't want you to know that your primary form of worship is the work that you do. But when you recognize that you are in full-time ministry right where you are, you're, a mission, you're on mission to build and advance God's kingdom right where he's placed you, and your work is worship, everything will take off. Those three paradigms lay the foundation for three principles. So our three principles all start with the word be, because you're a human being, not a human doing. You are not defined by what you do, you are defined by who you are. The first principle is to be faithful in little things. You know the story of David and Goliath. He was faithful with the lion and bear before he went and faced Goliath. When you're faithful when no one's watching, you'll be faithful when everyone is watching. Jesus talks about this in Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Look at what the scripture says. One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in very much. Now these are not Like, oh my goodness, these are the coolest principles ever. They are biblical, straight out of the word, and they are incredibly simple. That's the way that Jesus taught. He gave incredibly heavenly, incredible heavenly truths, but he boiled it all down to something just so simple. Now, in my life, personally, I learned how to be faithful in little things in a very difficult way because God had to break me of something. I got traded from Boston to St. Louis in 99 when Brett Saberhagen went down with a shoulder injury and St. Louis scooped me up one other minor league player for a major league pitcher. Now I'm find myself playing with St. Louis Cardinals. I'm in major league spring training and back to the minor leagues and I kept bouncing back and forth like a yo-yo. I had been married at the time. I had my second kid and I told my wife, I said, listen, if I don't go to the big leagues this next season after spring training, we're out. And so I didn't go to the big leagues. I ended up getting booted back to the minor leagues and I said, I think we need to be done. Now, Jason had already gotten out of baseball. He was living in Charlotte, and I asked him to find me a job. He called me, he said, David, I found you a job. Because I didn't make any money, big money, uh, as a pro baseball player. I needed to provide for my family. And so Jason said, I found you a job. I said, what is it? He says, it's a janitor at a local high school. I said, man, I've never janited a day in my life. I thank God for all the folks that keep our places clean and running. Thank you, Jesus, for them. But I'm not one of them because I'm terrible with my hands. I don't know how to do any of that stuff. Well, I prayed about it. I called my agent. My agent said, well, let me ask real quick if there's anybody else out there might give you a shot for the big leagues. He called me back and said, Colorado Rockies just made you an offer. So now I have the Rockies janitor. And then God put something in my heart, go be a janitor, and I did. So I moved my family to Charlotte, North Carolina, and over the next 12 months, the Lord did surgery on my heart. That was one of the hardest times of my life because it all came to a head when I'm sitting at the sports awards ceremony at this high school, and everybody's all dressed up in their tuxes and everything. I'm in the back with my khakis and trash bags hanging out of my pocket and a big key ring. I had no idea what most of them went to. And I'm like, I did not imagine seeing myself at 26 here. I was gonna hit the game-winning home run in the World Series uh, and go to the Hall of Fame. Jason was gonna come off the bench, greet me at the plate. It was gonna be amazing. I had this all played out because God needs successful Christians to glorify him. No, he just needs faithful Christians. Well, I was having this battle, this identity crisis because I loved being a pro athlete. I loved the accolades that I did. I did not love just being a guy who went from swinging a baseball bat to pushing a broom. I didn't like that. And I start having this conversation with the Lord at that sports awards ceremony. Lord, this isn't what I thought it was gonna be. And the Lord spoke right to my heart. I had been in the word enough to where the Holy Spirit could use the word of God in my life. And he spoke to me, do you love me for my blessings or do you love me for who I am? And I was like, Lord, I love you for who you are. And I remember when I was a kid, my dad would say, boys, if you guys love Jesus for what he gives you, then you're gonna hate him for what he takes from you. You need to love him for who he is the Savior who took your sins on that cross. 
the resurrected Lord who gives you power to overcome sin and to be his agents, his ambassadors in this culture. Don't just love him for what he gives you, love him for who he is. And I remember all this came rushing to my head and I remember the Lord said, you need to repent of your sin, of being tied up with your identity as to what you do instead of who you are in me. Now be faithful in the little things. And I remember this so vividly in my spirit. You be faithful plunging toilets like you were swinging a bat. You be faithful pushing a broom like you were signing autographs. And I remember saying, Lord, I commit, I will be faithful in the little things for the rest of my life to the best of my ability. Well, David went from a baseball bat to a broomstick. He had a lot of, uh, uh, you know, he had a lot of ideas about broomstick because his fifth grade girlfriend used to fly around on one. Okay, anyway, Jason. Sorry, I didn't mean that. Man. You remember her? Oh, sorry. Stop. All right, so be faithful in little. Principle number two, be an appetite creator. What in the world do we mean by that? What we're talking about is leadership. As salt and light, you are called to be a leader. And leadership is the ability to create an appetite in other people. And that's what God calls us all to be. Proverbs 22, six. Train up a child in the way he should go, and in the end, he will not depart from it. How many parents we got in here? Oh man, we're holding on to this verse, right? But do you know the word, the Hebrew phrase for train up means to touch the palate of and Solomon, who wrote this verse, he's the wisest man who ever lived, he wrote this, and to touch the palate of means that when the Hebrew wives back in the day, they used to have babies, they didn't have baby food like what we have, and infants, and they would take uh, fruits, veggies, or whatever, and chew it up really fine. They'd take a piece of it out of their mouth, put it onto the tip of their finger, they would open the mouth of their, their infant, and then they would touch the palate of their mouth with that food, and that would kick in the salivary glands, and then that baby would begin to cult cultivate a taste for that particular food. And Solomon says, train them up that way, which basically means, as parents, create appetites in your kids for me. Create the proper appetites in your children. But we're all supposed to do that with the people that we're around. As a student in school, create an appetite in your friends for godly things, for good things, for hard work, for discipline, for motivation, those types of things. That's what we're talking about here. It's all about leadership. And you wanna know the number one appetite that you can create in other people? The appetite for courage. The appetite to stand strong and be bold. We saw this in our dad. He taught us, boys, when you stand for God, God stands for you. And David and I talk a lot about standing bold in culture, but you wanna know one of the most bold things that you can do with salt and light? Share your faith with someone else. Have you ever felt that? where you're talking with somebody and you feel the Holy Spirit tell you, maybe I should share my faith with him or maybe I should ask him if I could pray for them or anything like that and then immediately fear comes flooding in. You're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how they're gonna respond to that. They're gonna think I'm crazy. We all feel that, don't we? Well, I remember a time feeling this. And my dad had taught me, when you stand for God, he stands for you. I was playing with the Orioles. I was actually in the minor leagues in A-ball in Frederick, Maryland. And we were in a stadium, the stadium had about 5,000 seats, and on this night, it was student night. So they invited all these parents and their elementary and junior high school kids there, and it was packed out. We were stretching out in right field, there's 30, 45 minutes to go before the game started, and one of the people from the front office came down to the field, and she said, hey, we want a player to address the crowd before the game for about 60 seconds and tell the crowd about the importance of reading books. And then she looks at me and she walks over to me and she said, we were thinking that it would be good, Jason, for you to do that. I'm like, well, what gave you that idea? I did have a Bible study with the, with the group and all that, so maybe they thought I liked to speak. And, but I remember her saying, we'd like for you to address the crowd, but listen, we know you're a Christian. You can't, this isn't like a time for you to preach or anything. You only have 60 seconds. The minute she's like, hey, we want you to speak, my heart started beating so fast. Would you guys have been scared too or is this just me? <laughs> I need your approval right now. I need some approval. Stop, okay, thank you. Dude, you're Makes so you feel weak. so much better, guys. But I remember my heart was beating really fast and I could hear the voice of my dad is like, when God taps you on the shoulder, just say yes. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. I'm like, I don't want to. But I had no idea what I would say. All I know is that my directive was, you have to say something about books and you can't preach a message. Well, I go back into the clubhouse. I find a, a spot alone. I get down on my knees and I'm like, Lord, I have no idea what I'm gonna say. But I know that you've tapped me on the shoulder. You've given me this opportunity and I wanna say something about you. I don't have much time, and I have no idea what I'm gonna say. And so I got up from that, and then 
about 20, 30 minutes went by, the game's about to start, we're about five, 10 minutes before the game time, and the microphone is standing out there at home plate. The other team's in their dugout, our team's in our dugout. She looks over at me, the girl that told me from the front office to go say something, and she goes, and I go walking out there, and at this point I had no idea what I was gonna say. All I had was a willingness to say something. And I was walking out there while I was praying. I was like, God, please give me the right words to say. Tell me not to be a fool. Like, this could be crazy. I thought every, because as I started walking out, the whole place got silent. And I thought everybody thought I was going to sing the national anthem or whatever. Like, I'm like, take it, you know, just. And so I started walking out. And I got to the plate. And the minute I got to the plate, I felt something come over me. I'm telling you, I grabbed a hold of that microphone. And I said, you know, I've heard it said that the two greatest things in life are the people that you meet and the books that you read. And the greatest person that I've ever met is Jesus Christ, and the greatest book I've ever read is the Holy Bible, and Jesus promises that he'll change your life if you read his book. <laughs> Listen, I had no idea that even came out of my mouth. All I know that as I was walking back, the entire audience, all 5,000 people erupted, stood to their feet, clapping, cheering, and as I was walking to the dugout, I saw a dad standing right next to his son. He's like, Thank you for saying it like it is. You see, in that moment, I, like, you know, all I had was a willingness. I'm like, okay, Lord, I don't know what I'm gonna say, but I'll, I'm going in. That's all God wants from us is a willingness. And that moment right there created an appetite. I know in other kids, and that's why that dad was so thankful for them to stand bold when their time came, when God tapped them on the shoulder. So we wanna be faithful in a little, and we also want to be appetite creators. And when the sh culture shifts, because there's not 5,000 people gonna jump to their feet at a baseball game these days. Even if they wanted to, they would be afraid to, many people, because of what's happening. So what are we supposed to do in the middle of all that? Our third principle, you're supposed to be a chocolate chip. Oh, oh you missed that one. Yeah, let's, that's a Read great that. quote, by the way. When a brave man takes a stand, oh, the spines of others are stiffened. That's good, yeah, we like that. Like all right, go to my principle now, Jason. <laughs> you totally screwed that up. Be a chocolate chip in the cookie dough of culture. You like that, don't you? <laughs> we can, I, that, that really made me feel good, because we came up with this. We wrote our second book, Living Among Lions, How to Thrive Like Daniel in Today's Babylon, and we were praying and fasting and asking God, how do we communicate what you've called us to be as Christians, as salt and light, how do we communicate it in a way that everybody's gonna get and everybody's gonna like it, and the Lord gave this to us as we were praying. You see, we're supposed to be a chocolate chip in the cookie, of, cookie dough of culture. We mix in, we don't blend in. We keep our distinct form even when put in an oven, even when the heat turns up. Think about that, you've ever made chocolate chip? How many of you have made chocolate chip cookies before? Let me see those hands, there you go. Most of you dudes haven't done anything worthwhile. <laughs> but if you take butter, flour, sugar, salt, vanilla, all the good stuff, you know, and you blend it together and you take a bite, it tastes great, but it's, you don't just sit there and go, wow, that, that flour tastes great. Well, I taste the, you know, the vanilla or whatever. I mean, it just all blends together and is one taste, right? But when you mix in the chocolate chips and then you take a bite of the batch, yeah, you got that, didn't you? Yeah, it makes sense now. You see, the chocolate chips have a different nature. They don't blend in, they do mix in. And what happens when you put them on the cookie sheet or pan, I don't know, a cookie sheet, whatever it's called, and you stick it in the oven and you pull it out after the heat's turned up, can you still identify the chocolate chips? Yeah, isn't that good? That's what God calls us to be in the culture. Now, where do we get this from? The story of Daniel and is an amazing story. And for those of you that have never read the Bible and you don't know, Daniel was a young man who was a man of God, a Jewish boy who was taken from Jerusalem with three of his friends. Anybody know the name of his three friends? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You guys have watched Veggie Tales. Where'd they end up? The fiery furnace. Were they chocolate chips in the furnace of Babylon? You better believe it. They told Nebuchadnezzar, we ain't bowing to you. What are you, nuts? We ain't bowing to this culture. But see, Daniel and his three boys, his three buddies, they went into Babylon, and Babylon wanted to change them. The Babylonian king said, I want to give them new names. 
I wanna give them new outfits. I wanna teach them the language and the literature. In other words, I wanna immerse them with social media. I wanna immerse them with movies and music. I wanna immerse them with everything Babylon. But these boys, they refused to blend in. But they did mix in. And we see what happened in Daniel chapter six when Daniel was third in command now. Just a real quick theology. Babylon was then captured and destroyed by Persia. The Persian Empire was now ruling over the Babylonian province. And now the new king in Persia had elevated Daniel. Why? Because Daniel's work was worship. He was serving the one true God. And he was elevated to a prominent place in Persia. And his home actually was prominently displayed in the city. Now listen, there were many Jews that were taken captive and they were living in Persia. But every single time Daniel, he was, when, when, he was, when he wanted to live out his faith, it said three times a day, he would go to his room and he would pray with his windows open facing toward Jerusalem. In other words, this is what God promised. If you're ever taken captive, just know, you pray toward this temple. And just know, I will bring you back to the promised land. So now you have all these Jews in Persia. They're held captive. And every single day, 9 a.m., 12 p.m., 3 p.m., I can just see a dad with his 10-year-old boy walking through the city and saying, hey, I know we're living here in Persia, but there's another city called Jerusalem, and we're gonna go back there. Oh, by the way, it's, he's not looking at his watch, I'm sure, but he's like, watch, one of our guys, he's third in command. Check it out, watch this. And all of a sudden, there's Daniel praying on his knees, arms up, praying toward Jerusalem, toward Yahweh, saying, God, I know you are God. But guess what happened? The Persians didn't like the fact that Daniel was a man of God. It didn't like the fact that he and his boys were chocolate chips in the cookie dough of culture, so they created a law that targeted his faith. They said, for 30 days, you can't pray to anybody but the king of Persia. Now listen, if Daniel were like us when we wrote that email, it was his idea again, remember that, and we wrote this email to HGTV, here's what he probably would have said. Hey, listen, I know this law was written, and if I break this law, what was the punishment? The lion's den. You are gonna be thrown into the lion's den, and I could just see him reading this law and thinking, okay, every day I pray toward Jerusalem, honoring the God of of the Bible, or it wasn't the Bible then, it was the Septuagint, the Torah, the Matthew, Mark, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the prophetic books, and I will honor them. But you know, he could have easily said, I'm gonna stay out of this fight, and I'm gonna pray in the back of my room. Actually, or I'm just gonna kinda pray in the closet. God will understand. He's still God. But what did he do? It says in Daniel chapter six, go to that, go to that verse, Jason. Now, when Daniel had learned that the decree had been published. He went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open. Do you have the rest of that verse or no? No? Yep, open toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. Daniel didn't change. Can you imagine now that dad with his 10-year-old boy, there all the Jews are reading this decree, this law that these rebellious leaders had written and can you imagine them saying this? themselves, like, what's gonna happen? Like, oh my goodness. And I can imagine them being in the citadel of Susa where Daniel's house was. And I can imagine them saying, what's Daniel gonna do? It's now 8.58, two minutes counting down. What's Daniel gonna do? Like, should we, we're just gonna follow what Daniel does. And I can imagine like 10 seconds left, I can imagine the dad and, and all these Jewish people out there, like, what's gonna happen? And then all of a sudden, nine o'clock, boom, here comes Daniel, right in the face of the window, drops to his knees, hands up high, knowing I'm going straight to the lines. You see what he did? He just buggy whipped the forces of darkness that wanted to diminish and demean and demand his faith bow. And he said, no, I bow to the one true God and I will do it publicly and I don't care what it costs me. Do you see that faith? The same God of Daniel is our God. His name is Jesus Christ. Now, it was his faith looking toward Jesus. It's our faith looking back at what Jesus did. 
It is the same power. Now Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den. What happened to him? Nothing. Why? Those lions saw a bigger lion in him, the lion of the tribe of Judah. You know the lion of the tribe of Judah became a lamb for you and me? Allowed his throat to be slit and sacrificed. He was nailed to a cross. We just celebrated his death, burial, and resurrection last Sunday. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives in us if we know Jesus Christ, if we have prayed to receive Jesus Christ. And the same God of Daniel is our God. The same God of David is our God. The same God of Hannah, the same God of Mary, the same God of Deborah, the same God of the powerful men and women of faith is our God. We have nothing to be afraid of. We only have one responsibility, and that is to shine our light at this moment in history. You could have been born at any other moment in history, but God chose you to be born right now for such a time as this. You were born, and those of you that know Jesus, you were born again for this moment. So the question is, do you wanna shine his light? We gave you three paradigms and three principles. The paradigms, if you know Jesus, you're a minister, you're on mission and your work is worship. The three principles you can take away, be faithful and little, be an appetite creator, and be a chocolate chip in the cookie dough of culture. Now, as we close this, I wanna ask two questions. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, just you and Jesus, right now, just you and Jesus, turn those, turn those phones, click those phones off, no vibrations of your phone, nothing. Let's focus on Jesus right now. Let's get alone. It's just you and Jesus, eyes closed, heads bowed. If you do not know this lion whose name is Jesus, who became a lamb for you, if you do not know him and you have never accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior to forgive your sins and to save you for eternity, I'm gonna pray a prayer. And if that is you, I want you to pray that prayer. Now listen, this isn't some religious prayer. This prayer saves you. No, it's the heart of faith. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse nine and 10, that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. So this confession, this prayer, unites with a heart of faith and the promise of God is you will be saved. So I'm gonna pray a prayer. And then I'm gonna do another prayer. So I want everybody to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. So right now, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know what you did for me on the cross. You came to this earth. You lived a perfect life. And you died for my sins. I confess you as Lord. I ask you to come into my heart to save me and make me new. With all of my heart, I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your heads bowed, your eyes closed. For those of you that know Jesus, you're walking with him and you would say, I want power, I want God to fill me with boldness, I wanna be a bold witness and I wanna shine my light, but I need help. Just like the Benham brothers, I've been afraid, but I want help, I wanna pray, and I want you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for setting me apart. And I ask right now for the power of the Holy Spirit to fill me with boldness. Help me to be faithful in the little. Help me to be an appetite creator. Help me to be your chocolate chip in the cookie dough of culture. Fill me with strength in the name of Jesus, amen.